Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Slate Social Distancing Social. I hope you're having a wonderful afternoon. I'm Jen Daskal from American University, Washington College of Law. I also direct a fairly new tech law and security program there. And we have two really stellar panelists joining us today. Al Ghadari, the Consulting Director of Privacy at the Stanford Center for Internet for Internet and Society. Um, he is a, um, a stalwart in the privacy community and um, just a real um, powerhouse in think, helping us think through these issues. And we also have Catherine Waldron, who's a re resident fellow, national security and cybersecurity from R Street, um, who um, is, we are also just so delighted to have her join us as well today. Um, so we are going to spend the next hour talking about surveillance and privacy in the wake of the pandemic that we are all now experiencing. We will talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will turn to your questions. So please feel free to ask questions via the chat and we will um, get through as many of them, hopefully all of them before the end of the hour. So there's lots to talk about, lots to talk about the ways in which data can help us understand and respond to the health crisis that we now are all experiencing that's unfolding all around us. And we see in the news all the time, the various ways in which Governments um, are using data, sometimes data that's been collected for other purposes to help track and understand the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and there's also lots and lots of talk right now about new apps being developed, apps that can do a range of different things, some for contact tracing purposes, although as we will talk about in a moment, those are only as good as there is actually good testing and also some apps that can help um, do things like enforce ho home quarantines. Um, this is something that um, Poland has really developed, but it's, it's in use elsewhere as well. Um, I will just start by saying that um, in my view, we need to think about good health and good privacy as going hand in hand. They are essential as both are essential as we kind of move our way through this crisis and good privacy and good privacy practices help ensure that data is used in ways that can promote and, um, and have the, the buy-in from the general public in ways that can help promote the public health goals. Um, so to set the stage, I'm gonna turn first to Al. And Al, I hope you can help us walk through, when we talk about the various different kinds of health surveillance being discussed, what are we talking about? Sometimes we hear the discussion of aggregate level analysis or population level analysis. How does that differ? And what are the considerations with respect to aggregate level analysis versus individual tracing, um, which is often discussed as well? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Jen, and thanks to the sponsors for doing this. Uh, it's very timely. Uh, really when we're talking about technology and uh, public health here, we're mostly talking about location information, location information that resides with a variety of different providers, cell phone companies, uh, uh, platforms, application providers. And the theory is that with that location information in hand, coupled with a known diagnosis of infection, we can do a lot of things at scale that we can't currently do manually. And there are two primary areas of interest and that's contact tracing. That is looking at uh, who the infected person has been in contact with over the prior days so you can identify and get them to self-isolate or quarantine. And then aggregate tracking at a, at a, a really at a population level to determine the trajectory of the disease. Uh, where are people moving? Where is the disease going? And you can use a variety of tools to, to determine that. They all come with various levels of privacy risks. And obviously at the individual level, it's more intrusive than it is at the aggregate level. None of these things we're talking about are truly anonymous because none of the public health activities that are necessary can be anonymous. You start with the public reporting of the illness by the local healthcare provider. Once a person is tested, they're known to the system and you begin the manual contact tracing activity. You're sharing 
who you've been involved with and where you've been, that information is making its way up the public health chain into the hands of public health authorities uh, at higher levels, ultimately the CDC. And then from that, uh, we're extrapolating data in the traditional way to look at tracking. So obviously a lot of flaws in the manual process, it's resource intensive, it's difficult to verify, memories are only so good 48 hours or 72 hours past. And so the notion that you can use the technology of location information uh, and extract it in a way that fills those gaps, makes it more reliable and actionable quicker and more effectively, it is, it is beguiling. Uh, but of course it comes with, with a variety of privacy risks. Great, so, so um, just to, to follow up on that and Catherine, I'll turn to you to, to weigh in a little bit. It sounds like a lot of what you were talking about falls within the category of individual tracing as opposed to aggregate level analysis. So you know, if we look at what some of the companies are doing, some of what they're doing is taking data that they already have to, to provide kind of maps of how well people are doing with social distancing, for example. Um, and that is done on an aggregate level without necessarily tracking particular individuals. Um, what I heard you primarily talking about, Al, was, a, was contact tracing, which does involve individual tracking of individuals. You have to do that in order to, to, to do the kind of contact tracing to provide the particular health benefit that that kind of program is trying to achieve. Now, you mentioned, Al, um, location tracing. Catherine, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the um, apps that are being developed um, and that um, and we all know that Google and Apple just made a big announcement this week about some of the work that they're doing. If you could talk a little bit about that and the possibility of doing proximity tracking as opposed to location tracking and what's the difference between the two, the two terms. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to automate this contact tracing, which has previously happened um, manually through asking people who, who they remember meeting, um, when you're trying to do that manually, you want to get, you want to know where the person was, or te technically, you want to know where they were. Um, and so there's a couple different ways to do that. You can try to get the information um, by knowing the location they were. Um, and then as Al said, there's a variety of different ways to determine where a person has been uh, geographically. Or um, as uh, Google and Apple are trying to explore with their new um, the new tools that they're developing and the apps that some of the countries overseas Singapore has had developed is you can try to use um, Bluetooth to see which devices have been near your phone. So the, the approach that Google and Apple are taking is that they hope to build a set of tools where your phone would create a log of all of the other um, phones or devices that you have been within a certain number of feet. Um, during the past 14 days, which is about how long it takes for symptoms of corona to manifest. And so your phone would create a log of every other device it's been near. Um, and then if, for example, you were later determined to be positive, to test positive for COVID-19, you could send out an automatic alert to let every other device know, and then they could trigger um, a notification to tell people in question. So this way, people who, you know, you maybe don't remember passing on the street at all, um, people that you don't, um, that you didn't have any sort of, there's no way that you knew their information and could pass it on with manual um, contact testing, tra tracking, you could still, they could still be notified. Um, and this is viewed by a lot of people as a little less invasive um, because the Bluetooth doesn't actually track where you were. So it knows you were in contact with another person, but it doesn't know where that contact happened. Right, so Elle, what do you think? Can this be done and protect privacy at the same time? Um, sure, so, so the benefit of the Google Apple approach is it's decentralized, and that is that none of the data resides with a government agency, and it is as close to anonymous as you can get, uh, technically. Uh, so, so there's, there are some potential weaknesses or flaws that people have identified in using Bluetooth from a security perspective, but on balance, those risks are, are pretty small. 
Um, one I've heard said repeatedly is there's a false positive risk of doing that, that it, you might uh, uh, see your neighbor through a wall six feet away and you've never come in contact and that's considered a false positive. But um, knowing your neighbor has it in your apartment house, for example, is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, so, you know, there are some potential security issues, but by and large, the decentralized approach is about the most privacy protective approach you can take. Um, to juxtapose that against what uh, others have opposed or proposed, Singapore, for example, is a centralized approach. So that information from your Bluetooth device is uh, held by uh, a governmental agency. Uh, the Europeans are in a debate right now between whether it's a centralized or decentralized approach that they want to take. But the beauty of the Google Apple approach, in my view, is it's a platform level uh, 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 approach that works in the operating system itself to permit interoperability across both types of devices and operating systems at a scale that can reach 3 billion people. Uh, most of the other apps we're talking about, government sponsored or nation state sponsored, are just insufficient to reach scale enough to warn enough people to allow them to do the right thing, get off the street, stay at home till they're inoculated or until the, the quarantine time has passed. So, so I think it's about the best you can achieve using any of the location technologies while protecting privacy. And, and there are a couple of, of apps and approaches out there. Because remember, ultimately, the Google Apple approach is to create an operating system level, a platform level. It's not the app itself. Those apps will be developed by the various states and agencies that use it and working with Google, you'll download that from the Google Play Store or the Apple Store and install it on your device. And so, you know, you're going to get, if you're infected, a token, you're going to get an, an indicator from the state in the app that says so as a result of your testing. And that's how we're going to broadcast. So, so there is still some concern that your individual status is known to the state, but as I said at the outset, it is already known to the state because you've been tested. So I, I think on balance, uh, the privacy concerns uh, are, are well outweighed by the benefit of, of this proximity testing and approach. So, um you, you talked about the fact that everybody, that different countries are, are developing different apps, different universities are developing different apps, different nonprofits are developing different apps. How, how does that, if everybody has downloaded a different app, how does that work on the Google Apple system? Will they be interoperable so that, um, or does everybody have to have the same app in order to actually get the, the, the relevant information passed on? Yeah, well, it, it won't work on the Google Apple system, and that's the intention. The intention is that those state authorities, the public health organizations, have the uh, particular application for that purpose, and then users will download the state-sponsored app for that. It's not intended, at least as I understand it today, it's not intended that an employer would be able to download it and use it with their employees or that uh, any group of, of uh, organizations would be able to deploy it. You have to sign, you will be required to sign uh, an agreement uh, just like any other app developer would have to sign. Uh, it'll be restrictive. It's not going to allow this application to pull other sources of location data out of your device. Uh, so the intention is very limited and uh, uh, short term. And the benefit is, again, uh, separately, that Google will remove this app when public health declares the emergency over. So the operating system level hooks will be removed at the end of, of the crisis. Um, so, so again, the, the states, those public health organizations will be required to sign up for uh, the access and then the app they push to users at the end of the day uh, 
it we would you'll need to sign up for as an individual to share it and it is an opt-in approach if you choose not to do it uh, you're not at this point able to be required to do it what happens when just just back to you for one more question on this what happens when people cross borders so less of an issue in the united states but think about europe where people are moving you know eventually people will be moving back and forth with regularity is it will the contact tracing work across borders or does do, does do individuals who, who cross borders have to download the relevant country app for each country um, so it, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to whether you will need multiple apps for each state in each country you're in. Uh, I don't believe that's been resolved. And obviously, I'm not a spokesman for Google here either. But, but I, it, my understanding is the interoperability benefit of it is it doesn't matter what country you go to. The operating system access exists. If the country uh, agrees to the same terms, their app will work. And, and in Europe, you have a competing group of um, uh, professors and academics who've developed a different approach to it that would have been a centralized approach, and a second group who've developed an application approach, which is the decentralized API. So they have yet to make that decision and presumably because Google and Apple have already done the heavy lifting on the gut works of the platforms, uh, they will probably, in order to get the applications out fast, follow along with, with that model and sign up to develop their own apps that work within in, in the framework that Google and Apple have set. Uh, I don't, again, I don't know for sure whether Germany or UK will agree with that or want their own centralized approach, uh, like Singapore, for example. It is entirely feasible that uh, they will decide that it must be a mandatory downloaded app that works uh, for whatever country we're talking about, and that each person, like in China, for example, must uh, download it. Uh, but they can do that as much as they want, but they won't get access to the Google or Apple data. So they'll, that would be an entirely separate concept uh, uh, and approach for them. So Kath, I'm just pulling, pulling back the lens a little bit. Um, I was also mentioning the point about the question about effectiveness. What do we need for, the, for this kind of system to be effective? So we've talked a little bit about scale. What kind of scale do you need in terms of people actually using these apps and what else do we need for this to actually be an effective system as well? So there's a couple of different things you need in order for the system to be effective. The whole purpose of the app is that it's scalable on the level that manual contact tracing isn't. Um, but in order for the apps to work, you need a significant number of the population to buy in to say, yes, I am willing to download this on my phone and I'm willing to use it. Um, and then you also need to have um, widespread testing. So the way the apps are currently being designed is that you can't as an individual say, oh, I have COVID-19. Um, because you, what you don't want is someone going in and creating like mass panic or hysteria um, and requiring people to quarantine when in fact that person doesn't have um, COVID-19. And so the way they're being designed as of right now is that you would need an official um, health official who has like tested and received the results to say, yes, this person has COVID-19. And then you can send out the notification to alert everyone else. Oh, hey, you've been in the, the proximity with someone who um, has tested positive. And so if we don't have widespread testing, then it really doesn't matter um, how many people have used the app um, because there could be people who, you know, they have been in proximity, they have the app, they have COVID-19, but they can't get their test results back fast enough. Um, and so then all those people that they've been in touch with, um, they can't be alerted. Uh, the other difficulty is, of course, getting people to download the app. Um, while the Apple Google approach has a lot of built-in privacy features, nonetheless, the idea of having an app on your phone that's tracking the people you interact with, um, I think that will raise uh, like alarms for a lot of just everyday Americans. And you, if you don't have a per certain percentage of people to buy in, um, then it doesn't really matter. And even if people have the app on their phone, like maybe they don't take the, their phone out with them every day. And so 
if that phone is not out there gathering the data, it's not really useful. Um, and they had this problem in Singapore actually, where they had the app and not a high enough percentage of the population was really buying in. You really need a significant um, percentage of the population. So between the testing and the user buy-in, um, while the app, the API set of tools is really, I think, quite useful um, in theory, it's, it's, we're gonna have to see if it's actually effective um, in practice. So yeah, that, that, that takes me back to you. So, and you mentioned this already, the possibility of governments mandating the downloading of the app or mandating this app. Is that something that could be done in the United States and should it be done? Um, I think that's just like the $60 million question. Uh, the first part is. The second part is nowhere should not be done. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, but a lot of people think it should. I mean, in, in all honesty, I think, you know, when you have a pandemic of scale that, that uh, uh, threatens the lives of millions of people, you can understand the desire to have something like this mandated and effective. But um, all you have to do is turn your phone off. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. So, so I, I think mandating it would, would be revolutionary in, in, in the sense that people just would not stand for it. And it's a red line, I think, for a lot of people. Um, I, I don't think the government necessarily has the power to do it either. And if you look by analogy, this reminds me a lot of the in, uh, Apple um, San Bernardino encryption problem on their phone, uh, mandating companies to change their platforms, to change their technology, to do things that aid the government. And it's great when you use the word public health as opposed to terrorism, but you know they are of the same um, uh, ilk. So, so I think it's a really tough thing to do. Um, and, and I'll just say one third thing and just sort of building on what Catherine said. I think the effectiveness, uh, to the extent it is more successful, the less we have to worry about the government stepping in. And so the fears that come from using an app like this, um, you know, can be blown out of proportion for the real risks and the benefits get overlooked while we worry too much. Um, we are never going to reach 100% on app download, but the truth is we also are not going to reach 100% of testing. It's impossible. The number of tests we would need each day for the next year till we have a vaccine cannot be built, cannot be processed, and cannot be distributed. It's just impossible. So some balance in between uptake on the app and more availability of testing is the only interim measure short of everybody stay in their house that we have. And success in efficacy may not be at 60% of the app as opposed to 20%. But for 20%, that's still better than zero. And, and it will not be a uniform across the country rollout either in many places, in communities, you may have 80% and in others you may have none. Uh, it's kind of like voting patterns. <laughs> you know, some people show up and some don't. So, so I think that, that we focus a lot on the risks and the negative. And if the conversation can change to more of the positives, that will be better for the long run. And I think people will be more comfortable with it if we don't cross those red lines that go to mandatory downloads. And I know we'll talk also about mandatory quarantines and, and individual tracking because those risks are also real and need to be considered in, in the decisions. So I want to turn away from the apps for a moment and talk a little bit about the CDC. So the CDC and the stimulus package got millions of dollars to do um, what, was, what is called pandemic surveillance. Catherine, what do we know about what the CDC is doing with that money, what it plans to do, what kind of, is it, is it gathering new data? What, what is it, what, what are the plans? What do we know? So the plans are still being determined to some extent. They received the money. Um, most of the funding the CDC has goes towards working, they partner with states and with local um, health facilities. So there will continue, be continued um, work in that area. One thing I do know that they're planning on working on is um, improving electronic health reporting. So the CDC has actually a program 
um, where different um, hospitals can report on health ca on cases um, electronically as opposed to like filling out a, a paperwork, sending a PDF to an email. Um, but the program up until now has not been used widely. Um, it's really only been used in a few counties um, and it hasn't necessarily been used on corona cases. So um, one thing the CDC has said that they're going to start doing is investing in that area and that way data can be spread, can be shared a lot faster. Al, anything to add about what the CDC is doing? Uh, it, no, I, I think that, that we still, even with their effort, however, lack a standardization of reporting. And, and I wish some of the funds would go to making it uh, a, a cleaner, clearer picture of what's gathered and, and uh, how everybody can uh, provide that in a standardized way because it, it is so disjointed across all of public health um, that you're not able to actually get a lot of data that you want as a result of the poor reporting. So um, we could do a lot with a, with a, a standard for uh, data collection. So you mentioned um, a, a second ago when we talked about this very early on about home quarantine apps. And so the possibility of, we've been talking about contact tracing and that's used um, to notify people that might not know that they've come into contact with somebody who turns out in fact was sick so that they can take precautions. Um, there's another question about what about situations where people are ordered to be quarantined because they tested positive or as is the case in some states um, out of staters are being told that they need to quarantine when they cross the borders into another state. What about the use of apps to enforce that? Poland, as I mentioned before, has a home quarantine app where individuals have to, at various points in the day, um, randomly or not randomly, but they're pinged and they have to upload um, geolocated fate images, photos of themselves establishing that they're at home. India has rolled out something like that in some parts of India as well. It's something that's being considered in other places. What do you think about that? Is that something that we should do to make sure that people actually stay home when they're supposed to stay home? Uh, do you want that first, Catherine? Yeah. <laughs> Thank I'll, God. I'll take that first. Yeah, I'll take that first and I'll, I'll let you have crack at the, uh, the legality um, of, of that as a lawyer in the group. Um, but yeah, I, you're absolutely right, Jen, that this is something we've seen um, being rolled out in several different countries. Poland has their selfie app. Um, India has done similar things. Um, and then there are other countries that instead of uploading a photo, um, they just have a geolocation tracker either on your phone um, or some other sort of device. And so if you leave your designated quarantine area, um, it, does, it sends a little ping to the proper authorities to be like, hey, you're outside of your area, you need to come back. Um, and in some places like China, if, if you're, that you can even be required to like send um, your temperature, to take your temperature and send that to police authorities. So there's, there's a wide spectrum um, of how invasive and intrusive um, the data required are is globally to uh, make sure that people are staying home. Um, in regards to whether or not we should do that in the U.S., um, I think up until now, most people have been, there have been stay-at-home orders, um, mm -hmm. but there hasn't been nearly as much of like legally required quarantining. Um, and I'll let, I'll talk about this, but as far as I am familiar with, this is something that could theoretically um, be legally possible um, within the state and local authority. Um, if that were to happen, um, I'll, I'll let you verify. But as far as I know, states do actually have um, the legal capacity to require people to quarantine. Um, and so if that were the case, I could see a scenario in which, you know, we did um, require um, selfies as a way to verify that you are in fact um, staying at home as opposed to just sending police around knocking on doors at random times to uh, enforce the quarantine. Yeah, it, it is um, one of the most interesting questions. Um, I've said before, if Typhoid Mary had a cell phone, we definitely would want to know where she was. Uh, as it was, she was uh, arrested and quarantined uh, numerous times, uh, and in fact had a surgery inflicted upon her. So I mean, you know, there's no question the government has an extraordinary amount of power when it comes to those who are infected. I think the question is a little more subtle with those who aren't. Uh, 
and those we don't know. And so um, it isn't really all that clear, as broad as the governmental powers are, and as well as they've been expressed in cases in the Supreme Court uh, and in state courts for uh, 150 years now. Uh, it isn't so clear that you can interfere with the rights of those who do not have a diagnosis and force them to stay in, at home. Uh, I do think the powers are broad, so yes. And so then the question becomes, would you rather have a technical means of ensuring those who are subject to quarantine remain at home while everyone else has some freedom? because they aren't subject to that, or would you rather everyone stay at home? And I think that's going to be the tension we'll have to deal with. And uh, the state powers here, uh, I think, are also broader at the state level than at the federal level. The statutory scheme at the federal level uh, uh, you know, has not been tested. We don't really have uh, uh, an array of court opinions looking at the exact language. and and its interpretation vis-a-vis -vis what states have the authority to do. So, so I think we, we may end up with this interesting tension between how various states approach it. And as we know, we are pretty well split in, in the philosophical views is some states refuse to close their beaches during spring break, <laughs> but quickly close their highways to prevent people driving from New York. Uh, into this day. So I think it'll be a really interesting question as we go along. And, then, and, and there just isn't a definitive answer, but fear the power because it is great. So let's, uh, let's just talk about the Fourth Amendment for a second here, if we can. Um, so, you know, we, you know, if we are talking about criminal law enforcement, we all know that the police can track individuals as they're moving freely through the streets. They can come and knock on your door and ask you all kinds of questions. And that's fine. That doesn't implicate the this, the, the restrictions on searches and seizures being, they have to be reasonable, but we, but there's a dividing line. So the police can't search your home or, um, or, or set up some sort of surveillance system in your home without a warrant. Do, is there a fourth amendment problem here if we start thinking about um, government monitoring via um, geolocation data, whether it's a selfie or just constant monitoring of people's movements in their own homes? Um, I, I think there's no question there's a Fourth Amendment argument here against it. There's uh, also a question of whether the public health crisis and Supreme Court precedent trumps it, and no pun intended. I think it's unclear whether or not the very, very broad language in the trilogy of cases starting with Gibbons coming forward actually stands for the proposition that some of those constitutional safeguards fall aside in a public health crisis uh, like a pandemic. Um, the problem is we don't have cases that tell us in specific examples whether that's so or not. But, you know, this Supreme Court uh, that is currently constituted uh, has been a lot more protective of the home, if you will, right? They don't like the invasion of technology beyond the four walls, uh, the outside four walls, starting really over the last 50 years from Kylo looking at whether you can, you know, look, peer into a home with heat-seeking devices and whether you can track a GPS monitor into a home and whether s cell towers uh, data that then tracking a phone within a home is permissible. And, and the trend really over the last, you know, couple of decades has been what's in the house survives many of the, the uh, efforts of law enforcement to, to invade uh, the home for whatever the stated purpose. But I don't think it's a settled question. And I think the more people keep talking about it and writing about it, the better it is to hone the question. So this kind of a discussion with in these webinars, I think is is not too early and and really needs to continue. No, I, I think it's a it's a fascinating question as well. And your analysis about the law, about law enforcement restrictions um, is obviously spot on. I think, the, as you pointed out, the key question here is whether or not 
there's a different rule if we're talking about a public health emergency and then separately whether it might kind of be shoehorned into a special needs type analysis as well. Um, so it's an interesting set of questions. Catherine, I'm gonna turn back to you. You mentioned China a few minutes ago and some of the mm -hmm. home quarantine re, uh, ways of, of monitoring home quarantines in China. Another thing um, that, as I know you know, China's been doing is mounting thermometers on facial recognition cameras. Um, and I, as we start thinking about maybe reopening our societies, stay at home orders get lift, lifted. What do we think about um, about thermometers, remote thermometers as a I posted and you have to cross through a remote thermometer to, to walk into a school or walk into a building or walk into um, a, a, a place of work. Is that something that, that we might start seeing? Is that something we should be encouraging? Is that something we should be worried about? I, I always hesitate to say we should follow China's lead. I don't think in this case we should follow China's lead. Um, it doesn't surprise me at all that China has, you know, mounted these thermometers, which they've actually had thermometers in place um, in certain areas um, for years. I know in the airport, um, they've had thermometers in place that you've had to, I've walked past them myself after um, their incidents with SARS and other um, more regional pandemics there. Um, and then also their use of facial recognition, which is fairly extensive. Um, and one thing to note about China is that a lot of this, the apparatus, the surveillance that's currently in place was actually in place before coronavirus was such a widespread problem. Um, China has their wide, their use of surveillance and cameras is almost omnipresent, um, especially in cities. And so a lot of the infrastructure um, that they're using now um, to combat coronavirus was actually already in place. And so we're just seeing them uh, really further um, use coronavirus as an excuse to further um, expand their surveillance apparatus. Um, I think we should be kind of alarmed about adopting any similar tactics um, in the United States. Uh, certainly, I could see where people might, you know, feel better. But um, once again, you have to ask where, where would that data go? Um, who's going to be hold? Like, suppose we require um, people to submit, you know, their their temperature to take their temperature and submit that to a database um, to check that every day. Where is that data going to be held? Um, what would happen um, if someone were found like out in public to um, have a slightly elevated temperature? Um, I could see examples where that could lead to um, all sorts of social shaming um, that we should be wary about. Um, so. I, I'm not necessarily an advocate um, of adopting similar stances here in the U.S. Uh, what do you think? Do, could, it be, could you have a system where you took somebody's temperature as they walked into buildings and it was, it was retained for you know, the 30 minutes, 15 minutes that you need to, to, to notify somebody and then destroy it? And would that satisfy the privacy concerns and help keep everybody more safe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, look, I, get, I think, again, it's the question of who, because if it's the government doing it, I think you'll have, you know, some significant pushback. Uh, if it's the, the commercial management company for the building, uh, you know, in downtown New York or Seattle or whatever city, uh, I think you have a different set of privacy issues. But, but as a matter of uh, anonymous uh, uh, temperature taking as you enter a building, just like a metal detector as you go through it. Uh, I think we are undoubtedly going to see those efforts. Uh, you already have that happening in nursing home facilities, for example. The staff that comes in to cook or do what they're doing uh, are being, you know, tested as they come in for temperatures. Uh, people delivering medicine are, have their temperature taken. So I, I think that's going to continue um, and, and will probably grow. And, and even in some federal facilities, I could see uh, steps like that being taken. But again, how long, who keeps the data, what do they do with it? These questions then devolve to existing privacy law. Uh, I feel better about doing that in California than I would in some other states, probably with the CCPA and CalEPA in place. Um, but, you know, I, I do think we are undoubtedly going to see that, and uh, it's probably going to be 
pretty widespread until we actually have inoculation or a vaccine uh, where we can solve the problem. So for the next 12 to 18 months, uh, if we're ever going to have schools open, I think you're going to have some manner and means of making sure the teachers are not um, uh, carrying. Let's turn to the to this question of so uh, immunity certificates. Um, we've seen a variety of countries talk about Germany, the UK talk about the possibility of once there's sufficiently widespread antibody testing that some people would be given basically certificates saying you get to you're clear, you get to go and participate, you get to go back to work, you get to travel, you get to do all these things. What's is that is that a a, a road that we should go down as we think about trying to reopen the economy more safely? Do we, are there concerns about that? What do you, I'm going to turn it back to you again, Catherine. What do you, what do you think? I think there's a couple things we need to keep in mind um, as we pursue this potential avenue. Um, one being working at the kinks with antibody tests, um, which as of right now um, are still being worked through. There's, there's some question about um, say antibody production in people who were asymptomatic um, there is some concern about people who had coronavirus, got better, um, but are actually getting it again. There have been a few cases where we've seen that. Um, and so the first step is technically making sure that antibody, antibody tests um, actually do prove that a person um, is um, essentially safe to release back into society. Um, but then there's also, I think, a social question, which is how would immunity certificates um, would, how would that create, how would that, would, would it create social risk essentially in society? Um, and would that be worth um, allowing these certificates to allow people to come back in in the hopes of like restarting economic activity? Um, there are countries out there, um, India has done this, other countries as well, um, that release information about people release far more information about people who test positive for coronavirus in the US. So we've, we've there in India, um, I was reading an article about Southern India where they released the addresses um, of people, not the names, but the addresses of people who had tested positive for coronavirus. Well, as you can imagine, if you have the address, it's not that hard for neighbors to figure out and release information about who actually um, has coronavirus. So I could see some, and then there was public shaming that ensued. So online, you'll see people who are bullying each other um, because so-and-so brought the coronavirus into the neighborhood. And so you want to be careful with immunity certificates that you don't create a similar sort of um, negative backlash against people who don't have immunity certificates um, as well. And so I think that is something to be thinking about. Carol, do you have anything to add to that? In the 1906 polio epidemic in New York City in Brooklyn, the health authorities nailed signs to the door outside, polio uh, infected person inside, do not enter. Um, HIPAA has an exemption for disclosure of directory information of, of uh, related to disease. Does that mean they can publish a nationwide directory of those who, who don't have the disease? Uh, you know. I think it really is going to be a, a tough question in the application of those certificates will be even uh, more problematic. If it's only used, for example, and issued to a teacher and the school district knows that and the teacher can go as a result, much less problematic. But if it's used to stop you at the border and not let you uh, drive into a state because you don't have one, or not enter an airplane, then I think we're going to have a, a much different conversation about the benefit or utility of those and the constitutionality of those um, uh, certificates as well. So in, in, in to say that correctly, if you don't have the certificate, you can't get on the plane or you can't go. So depriving you of your rights because you, know, you haven't uh, uh, passed the, the threshold. Um, you know, it, 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 and I'm sure there'll be, there'll be the next question of whether those are exclusively digital and can be copied. And again, you know, will we have deep fake certificates to worry about? So 
you know, it's, it, it, is, uh, it is an interesting new world of questions that, you know, each time you get a week further along in this debate, the next series of 10 very hard questions come up and we, we have yet to really delve into the answers deep enough to know because it's a very hard thing. So I'm going to start turning to some of the audience questions and several of them um, are similar to one another. So I'll try to um, combine some of them, please. Um, for everyone who's listening, um, send your questions via the chat and we will do our best to get to as many as possible. And so I'm going to start with, with um, a question about the harms. We've talked a lot about the value of decentralized collection and the harms of government collection. So there's a question but what are the harms of government collection? Why, why are we assuming that that's something we should be worried about? Bill, I'll let you start. Um, so I think we have a history in particularly after 9-11 where people found that uh, reaction to the threat in the heat of the moment created systems that people viewed as very intrusive to privacy that led to some individuals being wiretapped that shouldn't have been, some individuals suffering uh, embarrassment or, or other deprivations as a result. And I think people don't want to repeat that experience. Uh, they'd rather have a more thoughtful approach and a balanced approach. Uh, I, I certainly uh, feel like sometimes government overreaches and when there isn't a clear, transparent uh, roadmap for how the data could be used or would be used. For example, why has an HHS just simply published guidelines that say none of the data collected in the process of fighting the pandemic will be used for any purpose other than uh, public health and upon conclusion of this will be destroyed and no other agency will have access to it. Well, it's not hard. I just did it. Why, not, why isn't that the rule? then you'll have trust. And with trust, you won't have these questions about, did the NSA dip into that data for some reason we don't really know or understand? Uh, what about the map of your movements over the past 72 hours or prospectively over the next 32 days? What other agencies had access to it? So I think those are the harms we're trying to avoid and they're easily avoidable because there really isn't any purpose for any other government agency to have access to this data. I agree with Alan. I would just add, in addition to the concerns about which government agency um, has access to the data, anytime that you have like a large quantity of like a database along this scale, um, you also need to be concerned about um, what is the cybersecurity around this database. Not only who could legally view it, but what sort of malicious actors might be out there trying to access the data um, illegally, and how much do you trust the government to? implement the proper um, cybersecurity protocols. It raises an interesting question as, as well, though, about whether or not we trust the, mm -hmm. the app developers. So, mm -hmm. so the cybersecurity issues um, clearly are an issue when we create massive databases or when we create new systems of collection wherever they're held. So are we, are, do, we have, are you, do you have any concerns about that, Catherine, as well with respect to private sector and, and information that they are collecting or even information that's collected and held in a decentralized way on our phones? Does that solve some of the cybersecurity problems or do they still exist? Mm -hmm. um, I think the decentralization, to answer the last part of that question first, the decentralization um, of the data does help um, prevent some of the concerns in regards to cybersecurity and other issues. In regards to whether or not I have the same reservations towards private companies, uh, hosting large amounts of my data that I do towards the government? Um, the answer is both yes and no. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think in the same way that like, if that data is being held by uh, a private company, you know, hackers and other malicious actors have the same incentive to try to get in and access that data. Um, I do, however, think that, you know, if for some reason there is a breach or there is um, misuse of that data by a private company, there are more, um, legal um, and market recourses for um, punishment and incentives to prevent um, them from doing so. That doesn't mean that companies don't have the incentive, can't hide it in some way. Um, I think 
the there's been a lot of debate about how much we should trust large companies like Facebook with data in the past couple of years. Um, and that debate has by no means been solved. Um, so the concerns are still there. Um, but I do think that there are recourses that aren't necessarily there with the government when it comes to being like, oh, no, you did something we don't like. Let's find a way to either legally punish you or to withdraw market support to have customers say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm going to stop using your product, um, which you can't opt out to a different company when it comes to the government. I'll let you weigh in here. And you also, you previously mentioned the CCPA. I'm wondering if there's lessons about from the CCPA that apply to this as well. And if there's anything that this conversation tells us about um, the need for stronger federal privacy legislation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, look, I think, you know, just to f follow up with Catherine's point, the government has sovereign immunity. Um, Google and Apple don't. <laughs> so they can be sued. They're under, you know, at least Google has an FTC consent decree. There's supervision. And most importantly, they already have the data. We're talking about repurposing data that's had into a more, uh, an ability to share it with the government, which they otherwise would not be able to do and the users consenting to the sharing of that data in the first instance. So I think that's a really important distinction. And, and if you trust enough that they have the data to begin with, uh, it's not uh, inconceivable that having them handle it for this purpose, uh, you should trust as well. I think that, that the CCPA and Cal ECPA historically have moved the ball greatly forward for privacy protection and the use of data uh, uh, and, and, and really sets the path for a more national discussion on it. Unfortunately, I am not an optimist, <laughs> never getting there. Um, but, but, you know, between GDPR and CCPA, uh, I think all of the providers, platforms, telcos that have looked at this pandemic issue have approached it through that prism to begin with and asking the questions of, can I share it? Would it be limited in purpose if I did? And then could I be sure that happens? Will users have choice? Will it be transparent? And so I think it's set a model that is normative now, even if it isn't a national requirement now. So, so we owe something to, to that outcome and the companies that have all built their processes to meet CCPA are applying them here when it comes to thinking through how do they do something like the pandemic response that, and proposals that they've, they've had to deal with. So I want to stay on the question of decentralization. There were there were some audience questions about this as well. And going back to that to that conversation, when we talk about decentralization, just unpacking a little bit more about what we mean by that. So when when the when we when the system is decentralized, what and the government obviously has the health information and the our phones keep the proximity location information. There has to be some sharing between the two. How does that work and who gets access to that data as the data is shared? Or is it is it truly that private sector doesn't get the health information and the public sector truly doesn't get the proximity or location information? Um, yeah, that's exactly right. The, the, the information resides on the device. And so who you come in contact with and the alerts that are generated from it uh, are all uh, off of a centralized approach to that. So there's no server sending out those alerts. It's the device triggering the other device uh, for that warning. And the companies don't see that because it's on your device. And the government doesn't see that uh, because that's not visible to them. But the one-to-one -one relationship between the infected user and the government that led to the denomination of that user, the triggering of the Bluetooth signaling uh, as an infected person is known to the government, but they are known in any event. So it's, it's not new data. It's, it's new data that is actionable in a system that the government can't then see the results of. Um, there are those who argue uh, you've, there are things you can 
search very quickly and read about this in terms of whether it should be mandated so the government knows who was in proximity and then can take those steps mandatorily to do it. Uh, I think the consensus is that's not a system that people want. And so the decentralized approach leaves it in the hands of the individual to do the right thing rather than in the hands of the government to compel an outcome that may not be right in your individual case in any event. So I think that's, that's the, the point. Great, so we, um, there's, there's some wonderful questions that we unfortunately have not had a chance to get to, but I do wanna give both Catherine and Al, you a chance to provide any last minute thoughts, particularly about broad principles that we should be thinking about as we're, as we're kind of struggling with and we will continue to struggle with these really critical and yet incredibly difficult issues. Catherine, I'll, I'll let you start. Yeah, um, so first off, I would just like to reiterate once again, saying thank you to you, Jim, um, and you, Al, and also the people at New America for hosting this. In regards to like broad principles, I think people should keep in mind going forward. Um, I think when it comes to thinking about potential tools to use in the fight against coronavirus, um, we need to think very, we need to pay a lot of attention to the technical design um, behind a lot of these, these tools. And so always keep in mind, what is the data being collected? Who's going to hold the data? How long will the data be held? Um, and what type of data? Is this metadata? Is this data about my, end of, my individual life? Um, and so without asking those questions, it's really hard to actually compare and contrast all these different types of surveillance apparatus and apps that are actually being designed. And so while it might seem to everybody like, oh, every government is doing the same type of surveillance when it comes to coronavirus, there's actually a lot of nuance um, to be um, delved into and debated. And so always keeping those questions in mind and always going back to the most basic, like what is the data? Where is it gonna be held? How long, who can see it? Um, really helps you um, begin to parse out which solutions um, you agree with. I'll let you have the last word. Oh, I love that. Um, <laughs> look, I think trust and transparency are critical for the system to work. Uh, people need to understand there's no long tail to the data in the hand of the government. If you just don't know where your data is going to end up afterwards, you're just not going to share it and none of these systems will be very effective. Um, so transparency is key. Uh, second, I think um, you have to listen to the public health people, the epidemiologists, those who need data so that you know what data they need instead of throwing a bucket full of data uh, at them and just drowning them in useless information. So be, be really mindful of the efficacy of what's proposed and does it work. And, and, and even if we're just trying it to determine if it works, measure it at the end of the day and don't do it just for the sake of doing something. It's much more important to do the right thing. And lastly, um, I would say that, that uh, in, at the end of the day, uh, privacy is going to be just as important coming out of this as it was going in it. And there's a lot of lessons to learn from what's happened over the last few days and few weeks. And, and we should learn those lessons. Uh, there are many flaws in the HIPAA rules in terms of who gets access to what data and how in an emergency. And there are many flaws in, in, in the lack of, of knowledge about where that data ends up and what remedies users have at the end of the day. So that's, that's a, another discussion for another time, uh, but I, I hope we don't lose sight as we go along of uh, these risks. And I hope people keep raising the risks and challenging the accepted authority on both the technology and the law so we end up with a robust debate before we step off the cliff together. Well, I can't think of a better way to end. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you so much, Al. Thank you, Slate. Thank you, New America, for putting on this great podcast. Thank you all. Thank you. Stay safe. <laughs>